is the Blackmagic Ursa Mini G2, outdated in 2024. It's been almost five years since Blackmagic released this camera, and guess what? Now we have the full frame cinema camera on sale. That got me wondering which one of those cameras would I purchase today? Let's compare the image quality and find out if we can get better for cheap. Some folks out there may be wondering why am I not testing this against the Ursa 12K? Well, a few reasons really. One of the obvious ones for me is just availability. I own an Ursa G2 and a 6K full frame. I do often rent the 12K Ursa, but I'm finding it quite challenging where I live to find the newer model with the installed OLPF. And it would be quite unfair to compare it against the Ursa 12K without the OLPF filter. Please hit the subscribe button and I'll make sure that I do find one and make that video happen. The second reason would be price. I feel with the Ursa G2 being the much older model, it's more likely that you can find a good deal on the used market, bringing it that little bit closer to the price of the full frame 6K. And the last thing before we get into the test, I'm going to make the footage from the test downloadable in the description below. So if you wanna test the uncompressed files on your PC, Mac or laptop, then feel free to just go down there and click the link to download all the footage. Let's not waste any more time and jump into test number one. One thing you will notice as we go through the tests is that aligning and the framing is slightly off. I found this extremely difficult considering one is 6K open gate with a full frame sensor and the other camera is 16x9, 4.6K with a super 35mm sensor, meaning even with the same lens, the super 35 would be more cropped and I would have to move the physical tripod to try and line up the shots. I have a test comparing the difference in crop factor, but the first test up here is sharpness. My initial observation here is that the Ursa has nailed the white balance. It just appears more accurate to me, while the full frame looks a little bit warm. But in terms of sharpness, they seem quite close here at 100%. So let's zoom in for a closer look. We are now zoomed into 800% here. I believe that the Ursa appears sharper despite its lower resolution at 4.6K, but this probably is because of the OLPF filter inside of the full frame, as those filters tend to add a little bit of softness to your image. To me though, it does look a bit more noisy. I think this is because the grain will be larger on the 4.6K image. I'm not sure how well you guys can see this though after YouTube compression. Here on that same lens chart, I did some slow panning just to try and create some aliasing or more on the finer lines in the center of the chart. And if you look when we crop in, there is in fact some more present on the Ursa. It's not overly pronounced considering we're cropped in massively here, but it is there and you can notice it. Now moving on to the 6K full frame, one of its new features is an internal OLPF, standing for optical low pass filter. This significantly helps with reducing moray and aliasing. As we crop in here, I do notice there is an improvement over the Ursa. Around those fine lines, it just appears more static and a cleaner image. Onto a color chart here, I white balance both cameras to the same white card. The new Blackmagic Cinema Camera 6K picked a slightly warmer Kelvin and I stepped down the ISO on both cameras to try and reduce noise. The Ursa is much more saturated here to me. If you look at those yellow chips, they just are much more bright and pop out a little bit more. And the full frame just looks a little bit more muted. Comparing on a vector scope here to see what's happening, the full frame 6K is much more even on the scopes, forming more of a balanced circle. On the other hand, the Ursa is pushing more into yellows and reds. Obviously there is no right or wrong here. It depends on what you're capturing, but it's always good to know what our tools are actually doing. For dynamic range, I positioned myself in front of a window with a light set to 1%. I wanted to create a heavily backlit scenario and I exposed both cameras using false color until the sky behind me was just under the yellow color. In this scenario, both cameras performed exceptionally well. As always, Blackmagic's highlight roll-off is just superb. 
And while there is a bit more detail in my face and jumper on the Ursa, there is a noticeable noise in that detail. I appreciate how both cameras maintain good contrast straight out of camera, avoiding that kind of lifted shadows look that we used to get on the older pocket Blackmagic cameras. Same setup again here with the 1% light in the window, but this time I've put in a colour chart just to see if there is any colour differences. The results are remarkably close, examining the noise level on both, I would consider it a draw. Perhaps the Ursa is handling the highlight roll off slightly better, but there's a possibility that that contrast straight out of the full frame could look more appealing in certain situations, so I would call this a draw. In the rolling shutter test, I used the time metronome to pan both cameras at the same pace. As expected, it's a clear win for the Ursa in terms of rolling shutter. While the full frame does offer the gyro data that can be utilized to try and fix some of that rolling shutter, I found that I get mixed results. In my personal approach, I prefer moving down to Super 35 mode, which I find to be excellent on this full frame camera. It still provides a wider field of view than the Ursa, thanks to its 4.3 ratio. As you can see in this test, the adjustment brings the full frame much closer to the rolling shutter performance of the Ursa. Before we jump into the last three tests, I just wanted to touch on usability. This is somewhat subjective though, as if you needed a shoulder mount camera that is run and gun, then obviously the Ursa with its body design is going to have an advantage. But on the same hand, if you needed to run a gimbal for the day, then you would definitely want to pick the 6K full frame. The Ursa does come with built-in ND filters, it is a massive advantage for people that use this type of camera. It also has a built-in V-mount plate, two SDI outputs, four card slots, and two full-size XLRs. And that's without even getting into it, does XLR continuous power and takes time code a lot better. So if I had to choose one body design out of these two cameras, I think that I would definitely choose the Ursa Mini. However, the advantages of the OLPF and the smaller body design are not to be overlooked. I would love to see the L mount and the CF Express Type B media put inside of the next Ursa Mini. And more importantly for the full frame 6K is it comes at a much, much lower price point. And I think this is one of its biggest selling points. So let's get back to the tests. Now on to testing some super slow motion. For this test, I brought out an old money counter along with some prop money we used in a music video one time. On screen you can observe how fast it operates in real time. This will help gauge how much we are slowing down the footage in the tests. In this test at 120 frames per second from both cameras, the Earth achieves it without any crop using its full 4.6K sensor. On the other hand, the full frame 6K crops in significantly here to 1080p HD. To be fair though, side by side it doesn't perform too bad but it's evident that the Ursa takes a clear win here. The Ursa can also reach up to 300 frames per second, but it also crops in. While both usable if needed, having the capability to capture 300 frames per second is a pretty cool feature to have when that situation calls for it. In this setup, I aim to shoot at native ISO with mixed lighting and without adjusting for any crops, using the same DZO 25mm cine lens on both cameras. It's also good to note here that the neon sign in the background is flickering on both cameras, but this is just down to the hertz of the light and nothing to do with the cameras themselves. Comparing them, if you focus for a sec on that neon sign, it's apparent that the Ursa is pushing a little more saturation into it and this matches up with what we observed on the colour charts earlier. Personally, I kind of like the way that the full frame is handling it, but both cameras are delivering really nice images here straight out of camera. When comparing skin tones, the difference is very close. If I had to pick just one, maybe I would pick the Ursa as a slight edge. Overall, I do not think that anyone would easily tell any significant differences in skin tones between these two cameras. None of these cameras are what I would call low light cameras, but 
it's always good to see what kind of noise floors we are dealing with. Here I'm reducing the light and adjusting the aperture to maintain exposure while raising the ISO on both cameras. This is an ISO 1250, which activates that second native ISO range on the full frame 6K. The noise levels here seem pretty even, but one thing I have noticed is the skin tones on the ERSA have begun to appear a little bit strange, and it's something that I'm particularly not fond of. Moving up to 3200 ISO on both cameras, which is the maximum for the ERSA Mini G2, both have noticeable noise and would require denoising in post-production here. However, the full frame camera shows better color rendition. The skin tones on the ERSA at this point are just noticeably green. Finally, testing the maximum ISO of 8000 on the full frame. While this might not be a setting I'd personally use, having the option in camera can be valuable, especially for scenarios like documentary work, where capturing the shot is often priority over how much noise it would have. You might be wondering why I would buy a 6K full frame Blackmagic when I already own an Ursa Mini that does everything I need it to. Well, it's because of Hollywood. They do this one trick that once you implement it, it feels like cheating. And if you want to know what this one trick is, click this video right here.